I served as a social worker. I'm director of the Midwest Scholars Program. And I'll be talking to you the next couple. a need. And even though it hurts me regularly, it's not my need. I've got ankles and got elbows and got throats. But for some strange reason, the culture that I live in wants me to believe every moment of my life, every day, every night, a thought that I'm never supposed to get rid of, which is You know, it began before I was born. It began when mom and dad were wondering what was in my mommy's tummy. Back then, they didn't have ultrasound, so they had to guess. And they worried that if I was a boy, would they have blue things for my room? And if I was a girl, would they have enough pink? And they worried that if I was a boy, would I be good in math and science? And if I was a girl, would I? And if I was a girl, And if I was a girl, would I actually prefer math and science? We all tell ourselves, the feminists changed it all. Since the 1960s and the birth control pill, we could go out and do what we wanted. And from that point on, we were strong and empowered, and we didn't have to worry about our but I would submit to you, I would submit to you, and I want every single one of you, and particularly the females of you, think of Because every time I turn around, I am assaulted, and I am insulted by the beauty that comes at me in every television program, in every commercial, and hell, even Judge Judy looks pretty good for 70. And I ask myself, Judge, did you get those cheekbones all by yourself? Or did you have the money to get a surgeon to put them on you? And I ask myself, what does it say to me as a woman in this culture that day by day, by minute by minute, I am promised that the thing I can count on is feminist critic, Lori, Laura Mulder, wrote a seminal essay some 20 years ago where she talked about movie making, about cinema, and she identified a cultural phenomenon that affects not only the entertainment industry, but ultimately everything about the way that we work. She called it, anyone know? Gaze. Lori Mulvey, Laura Mulvey posits that everything in our world is constructed around the sense that things should be pleasing to the way that men behave. So much so that when you are an actress and you come to Hollywood, they look you up and down and they say, girl, you gotta get rid of 10 pounds there, but you need to add a couple of pounds here. And be sure that those cheekbones form a nice angle. Be sure that the hair is absolutely perfect. perfect brown. And of course, we do have contacts if your eyes just happen to be thin or brown. Make sure that that rear end looks delightful when you're photographed. Make sure that everything about you is pleasing to the men in the audience. And we might say, young women, well, we don't care. We like to look at Julia Roberts too, right? Right? What happens to that? That little girl who from the age of zero to about 11 loves to play with her trucks, loves to do math problems, really couldn't give a damn about Barbie dolls. But she watches TV. And she goes to the movies. And she believes those Disney princesses. What happens to the spirit of that child who certainly, insidiously, insidiously um, without even thinking about it, begins to do herself 
through the lens of those women who have had the silicon, who have had the uplift, who have had the lipo, who have had the cut and the paste. What happens to the spirit of that child? What happens is this. That is One day I'm out in the backyard. I love to get dirty. I ride my bike like the best of the boys. I can, have always been able to throw. My daddy taught me to throw when I was five. I can still pitch a really hard ball. And I'm a left-hander, but I can bat like the best of them. Right? I can run faster, fastest in my school. Taller than most of the boys, so I'm real good at basketball. Right? I am feeling my body. I am feeling myself. I know who I am. And then that one night, go in my room and I go, oh, I got a spot on my face. And I look in the mirror and then suddenly, instead of seeing Heather, I begin to see a Hollywood construction of And I am no longer seeing that little girl who can pitch that fastball and use that bat, who can outrun the boys and outbike even my dad. What I begin to see is, oh, my nose isn't fine enough lips are too big, my forehead is atrocious, and I don't have any cheekbones, and oh my God, we're not even going to talk about the girth, we're not even going to talk about, well, I won't tell you the size, because you know, you're probably looking already and trying to ascertain, right, <laughs> and something happened to me that night, and from that night forward, I never saw Heather again, I became a stranger to myself. And I would posit that most women in our culture are strangers to themselves. And that the pain of that estrangement, that alienation, is such that some of us starve ourselves to death, some of us eat ourselves to death, some of us cut ourselves. And most of us never trust another woman again. Because after all, women are competition for the male game. And what does this mean? Hey, been like this for a while, right? We're still here. We're not bad. We're, we're making it. Look at us. We're sitting here in this auditorium. We're strong. We're healthy. We are students. We are alive. Do you know what it really means? Is that a lot of us who might have been the next great mathematician, the next great scientist, hell, who might have just been better off staying single. Sell out the woman that we might have been. Out of fear that in some way, we will betray that social gaze. We will not be what the society tells us we have to be. And that is not who we really are. The society does not tell us we should be who we really are. The society does not care who we really are. Our culture is completely satisfied with us being No, 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 no. I'm not saying, you know, like, come to school with your hair all over the place. And I'm not saying don't wear makeup. I wear makeup. I enjoy makeup, right? I'm not saying that you shouldn't dress professionally when it's required. But I'm saying you wear shoes that leave your feet deformed because you're afraid to go outside without your heels. I'm saying if you wear pants that are so tight you can't breathe, I'm saying that if you are seriously contemplating spending the equivalent of a semester's tuition on some boobs, it's time to slow down and rethink. Now, am I speaking to you because I am there, I am reformed, I am totally in control, I know myself, and I'm completely at peace with who I am? Of course not. That would be nonsense. Every day of my life, I face this struggle. Every day of my life, as I choose my clothing, as I put on my makeup, as I decide how I'm going to do my hair, every day of my life, I am still working trying to become less of a stranger to myself and more of aware and more in sync with who God meant me to be. I ask you, I, I, I entreat you. Never go to yourself 
Don't see it as the end of your lives. See it as one of the best, most valuable, most rewarding, most noble of struggles. That if you are struggling with this when you are 90 years old, it's okay because it gives you a reason to love yourself because you are worth. Remember, Simone de Beauvoir said years ago that women are not born. 